my cap all over. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, welcome to Undocumented in the Academy. So we're here for a book talk and um, to discuss the memoir Undocumented, A Dominican Boy's Odyssey from a Homeless Shelter to the Ivy League by Daniel Padilla Peralta. And <clears throat> as he entered, we had a kind of soundtrack playing while everyone got settled. Um, of different songs exploring Afro-Latino identity. And this is part of a kind of ongoing conversation that we've been having here in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis related to Africana studies and immigration. So um, just to kind of introduce myself before I introduce our guest, my name is Tao Lee Goff, and I'm an assistant professor and faculty fellow in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. So I teach classes here on African and Asian diasporas, and today I've convened this event to extend a conversation about immigration, knowing our rights, and the undocumented experience post the election. Um, so this event is also co-sponsored by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. So I just wanted to mention an event that's coming up on Monday, May 1st, called Demystifying Haitian Spirituality and Religion. And it's taking place from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And it's very much in conversation with a lot that we're going to be talking about today with regards to the Dominican Republic and Caribbean identities. Another event that I kind of want to plug that I'll be involved in is a lunchtime conversation um, on sonics and sexuality in the Caribbean called Caribbean Queens. So that's going to be taking place on Thursday, May 4th from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Essentially what I'll be doing is presenting a showcase of work from students of mine from last semester um, from a class that I was teaching called Caribbean Writing, Reggae, and Roots. So um, in a lot of my classes I have my students produce a kind of creative digital soundtrack where they're mixing and DJing to um, really think about different images and sounds that speak to the Caribbean or whatever the topic of the course is. So that'll be a kind of showcase of those um, soundtracks. So just to give you a kind of overview and sense of the format for this evening, um, I'll begin just by introducing our esteemed guest here, Daniel Padilla Peralta. And then he's going to do um, a reading for us from various parts of his memoir, which was published in 2015 by Penguin. Then after that, we'll have a conversation, and I have a few questions prepared, um, as well as a couple of questions that the NYU Dream Team has contributed that they would um, like to hear addressed. And then after that, we'll have a question and answer session and open it up to you guys to see what's on your minds and is most pertinent. Um, another thing that I just wanted to mention is that the NYU bookstore is here, so we have a table in the back, and they're selling books for 20% off. Um, so we'll have an opportunity for book signings and then mixing and mingling with more empanadas and wine towards the end, if you guys like. Okay, <clears throat> so some of the themes that we're going to be addressing today are, you know, what it means to be undocumented, as well as the idea of a kind of impossible subjecthood. So splintered families, migration, memoir, wounded intimacies, and the African diaspora. These are kind of the key themes that I'm working through in terms of reading Danelle's book and thinking about the current moment. Um, so yeah, this event was generously co-sponsored by the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis and specifically Africana Studies within that, um, the Center of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Afro-Latino Forum, the Classics Department, the Dream Team, which I just mentioned before, and the Caribbean Students Association here at NYU. So our guest today um, was recently hired as a professor in the Classics Department at Princeton University, which is his alma mater. And he'll be telling us a bit about his journey to Princeton, I guess away from Princeton, then back to Princeton <laughs> again. Um, but there's so much that is really unresolved in his story of being undocumented, but today he's going to share from his memoir um, the way in which it really was a kind of odyssey for him and a kind of tripartite structure from childhood to boyhood to youth. Um, so Danielle arrived as a young boy with his um, mother and father from the Dominican Republic and his mother was seeking medical treatment. 
They overstayed their visa, and his mother was hoping for a better life for her two boys. Meanwhile, his father returned to the Caribbean. So I think far from telling a kind of triumphant success story of rags to riches or meritocracy, Danielle's story gives insight into the daily struggle of what it means to be undocumented and what it means to be in a legal state of limbo. His story illuminates what privilege and access means and the ways that the academy can potentially provide a kind of refuge in scholarship. So for many of us who are or have been undocumented, becoming almost hyper-documented with numerous degrees becomes a way of, pr of proving or performing our contribution to society and to ourselves. Um, but I think ultimately, Danelle provides us with a really important question about the tension of coming out and announcing your status to the world, which is something that he did when the Wall Street Journal um, published a profile on him in 2006 when he, um, it was announced that he would be the salutatorian of his Princeton graduating class, so addressing the Latin address um, to the students of the class of 2006. So the questions that I'm really concerned with as far as the memoir are, you know, what does it mean to be made an example? He also presents us with the tension of not wanting to be an exception to the rule or like a credit to the race, and yet wanting to have that freedom to live and work as you please. So there's a sort of unresolved tension, I think, between all of those different issues. So I mean, here we are, right, 97 days into the current administration, and a lot of promises have been made about immigration, including an increase in the number of ICE officials, um, the continuing debate about sanctuary, and with the rise of nationalism, we have to ask ourselves, is there any hope for immigration reform, or is that going to be a dream deferred? So today I want to place these pertinent questions in conversation with blackness and the optics and changing demographics of undocumented people. So we're actually at a point where the majority of um, undocumented migrants are no longer Mexican, but are in fact Central American and Asian. So I think that's something else that we can also continue to discuss. Like what do people imagine when they hear the term undocumented? Um, <clears throat> so. The question is, um, how does race determine who is assumed to be quote unquote native and who is considered to be alien? I think one way to kind of grapple with this is to um, think about the term that the historian May Nai uses, which is impossible subject. So that's the state in which the illegal alien as a new legal and political subject was kind of invented in a sense. So whose inc inclusion within the nation was simultaneously a social reality and a legal impossibility. The subject <clears throat> barred from citizenship and without rights. Moreover, the need of state, the need of the state authorities, sorry, to identify and distinguish between citizens, lawfully resident immigrants and illegal aliens posed enforcement, political, and constitutional problems for the modern state. So really what we're dealing with in terms of thinking about an impossible subject is this kind of modern problem and conundrum in terms of someone who is within the borders of the state and yet is being considered to almost not be there. Um, so she says, thus, the illegal alien is an impossible subject a person who cannot be, and a person that cannot be solved. So I also wanted to um, quote another person who Danelle quotes in the beginning of his book. Um, and it's really, I guess, eerie reading your memoir at this moment in terms of how much has even changed since 2015. So the book begins with a number of epigraphs, but one of them is from who was then the Senator Jeff Sessions, who says, quote, fundamentally almost no one coming from the Dominican Republic to the United States is coming because they have a skill that would benefit us and that would indicate their likely success in our society. And this is quoted from May 22nd, 2006. So bearing those two kinds of ideas in mind, um, I would like you all to join me in welcoming our guest, Professor Danielle Padilla Peralta. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's cool if I just sit like this and don't have to get 
all up in the mic like this. <laughs> all right, good. So I, I want to thank all of you for being here, but I want to thank Cal for inviting me and for making this possible. Uh, I'm really happy to be uh, here tonight to have a conversation with you all, uh, and I hope that it really is that, a conversation. Uh, what I really like about this Jeff Sessions quote, uh, which when I came across it in 2006 infuriated me to no end, uh, is that it does two things. Uh, the first, obviously, uh, is that it sets up uh, a kind of contrastive, a kind of foil that I uh, elected to arrange the opening parts of the memoir around, right? This idea that there are no Dominicans who have the kinds of skills that are needed for success uh, in American society. But there's a second register to this quote, um, and what I see in this quote is really provocative uh, is the invitation it provides us to think about how immigration discourses center on questions of merit and on the adjudication of merit as contingent in part on skill. And how that skill is defined and how that skill is apportioned is something very much uh, the front and center of immigration debates these days. The differentiation between skilled and unskilled labor is one of the organizing principles of the 21st century immigration system, not just in the United States, but elsewhere in the world. And this differentiation, uh, seeing as it carves up immigrant communities and prospective immigrants, uh, according to axes of skill, uh, is something that I hope we can talk about uh, over the course of our conversation. I see this emphasis on skill and its corresponding uh, priority, prioritization of economic utility uh, to be two features of the immigration discourse that run counter to the ethical sensibilities that I think we need to adopt towards immigrants, uh, and that run counter to the idea of viewing immigrants not as bearers of some kind of skill or as units of economic utility, but as human beings, as human beings to whom we owe just treatment. So with that out of the way, uh, and with references to Sessions, uh, sideline for the time being, uh, I am going to read three selections from the book. Uh, the first selection is from the prologue. Uh, the second selection is from one of the chapters devoted to my family stint in the shelter system. And the third selection is from uh, a chapter devoted to my freshman and sophomore years at Princeton. So I'll begin. Every weekday morning of my high school years, I left my apartment building in Spanish Harlem and took the subway or bus to Manhattan's Upper West Side where I attended private school. Whenever I wasn't navigating the streets on autopilot, I'd be confronted by the differences between Harlem World and the Upper West, no matter how hard I tried to shut them out. The streets around my Upper West Side private school were mostly clean. The streets in my hood were littered with trash. Broadway had ritzy shops and clean storefronts. 116th Street had 99 cent shops, dusty and crusty storefronts. The Upper West had white kids loitering around Zay bars. My block had black and Latino hood rats loitering around outside apartment buildings. And the police, I'd see one or two or on a truly exceptional day, three on Broadway, usually hitting up the bagel spot between 79th and 80th. But the baton-wielding blue rolled deep where I lived. During the school day, my private school made it easy to forget these differences. Science classrooms decked out with the newest technology, an upper school student center trashed in a way I was beginning to recognize as the mark of entitled brattiness, the guitar and bed equipped office of my high school advisor. I inhabited daytime spaces that bore not a single trace of that other life I lived on weeknights and weekends. Sometimes though, that other life intruded into the realm of my immersion in white boy privilege. The hood would come knocking or just smash through the door. Daniel, the police just searched our apartment for drugs. I took mom's call outside my school's computer room where I'd been proofreading the school newspaper. I'd ignored the first ring of my cell phone, thinking mom was just calling to ask when I'd be home for dinner. But when she rang a second time, I'd grown worried and picked up. What? What happened? Why did they think we had drugs? Did they say? Me, it's going to be OK now. They made a big mistake. They had one cop who speaks a little Spanish explain to me what went wrong. They'd received a call from someone who told them dealers were stashing drugs in an apartment in our building. The cops thought the informant said apartment 2B, so they came to our apartment. So they were there when you got home from church? They knocked down the door. They were searching everything. They searched my bedroom, the table where I had the candles for Los Santos, the living room, the kitchen, the bedrooms. I'm just so happy that your little brother was at chorus rehearsal, not at home. Thank God. Do they still think we're involved with drug dealers? I know me. So they're searching everywhere, and I'm telling them over and over again that they're wrong. 
that we're a family of God and I'm just a single mother raising two children. I showed them all your books. I told them you go to a famous private school on full scholarship, but they wouldn't believe anything I told them. They just kept asking where the drugs were. But finally, finally, thank you, Virgin Mary. One of the police officers took out his radio and spoke with the police officer standing outside our building. That's when another cop came up to me and said that they were extremely sorry, that it had all been a mistake, that they were supposed to be investigating another apartment instead. And you should have seen them, Daniel, how nice they were when they realized their mistake. They're even going to pay to have our door fixed. Those sinvergüenza cops, Daniel, they were doing their job, my son. It's over now. Did they ask about our immigration status? Thank God, no, my son. They didn't ask me for papeles or anything like that. I let out a small sigh of relief. Mom continued. But I must have interrupted you, my son. You're still at school working on the newspaper, right? Everything's OK. I just wanted you to know what had happened. Get back to what you were doing, and I'll see you at home for dinner. Yo te bendiga. I returned to the computer room. All eyes were turned to Britney Spears who was shaking and dancing on one of the computer screens. One of my friends asked me if anything was wrong. Me? I replied, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Brittany can hit me baby all she wants. <laughs> he laughed. I took a seat a few computers away from the Brittany show and admired her moves. By the time the gyrations came to an end, my newspaper buddies and I were hard at work. When we were done editing an hour later, I packed up, told my editors in arms that I'd see them the next day in class, and peace for the afternoon. At no point then, or after, did I seriously consider telling any of them, or any of my <laughs> other classmates, what had just taken place back home. I was 17. In my teenage negotiation of the divide between hood life and school life, I was carefully managing which aspects of myself I'd present to the people around me. In conversations and interactions with family members, mentors, friends, I tried to be a normal, slightly immature kid with a healthy interest in pop culture and a passionate love of reading. To them all, I simply wanted to be a slang-dropping, rapping, pop-versifying, slightly nerdy, Britney-loving teenager. And this front would stay firmly in place for years. Then, and later, I didn't want to go to the trouble of explaining to people the lives I was living. Skeptic son of a pious mother, undocumented immigrant, Dominican in Harlem, food stamp recipient at a New York City private school, Ivy Leaguer, Dominican expat without papers. A part of me worried that those closest to me wouldn't fully understand, another part, that they wouldn't care. And a third part was busy cultivating some ironic distance from it all. Why did I even have to sweat myself in my situation? Was I even that special? It was so played out, this whole hood boy and Richie Rich school saga. My story was just a variation on a familiar theme. This book is about how I came to embrace and celebrate the variety and contradictions that make up my life. If the essential arc is of an undocumented Dominican immigrant who became captivated by the study of the Greek and Latin classics, the parallel narrative is of how a boy so fearful for so long of sharing the real story of himself with others decided to let it all hang. Complexity is daunting, and to paraphrase T.S. Eliot's proof rock, it can be impossible to say just what you mean. But I would rather run after the impossible than live as a string of labels, undocumented, hood rat, Dominican, classicist. I am all of those things. No one or two of them define me. So that is selection one. Yay. <laughs> now, uh, thank you. Now, we could do the thing where I like perform exegesis on these passages, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's played out. <laughs> Um, I'll, we can come back uh, to the selections uh, if and how you'd like uh, for me to come back to them. Um, and certainly, I'd be happy to talk more about the individual selections uh, once we're done. This second selection uh, is from the chapter devoted to our stint in the shelter system. Uh, so after my dad left my family and returned to the Dominican Republic in 1993, uh, my mom, my brother, and I were evicted from our apartment in Jackson Heights, Queens. And we went to spend a few nights at the basement uh, of a family friend. Uh, but one night while we were sleeping, the piping in the basement burst. The basement flooded. Uh, and my mom dragged us out. Uh, we then reported to the local police precinct. Uh, the police and law enforcement generally uh, are featured at various points in the memoir. And 
at the precinct, we were directed to an intake center for homeless families in the Bronx, uh, the emergency relocation center, uh, not too far away from Yankee Stadium. Uh, and after spending a few nights there, we were sent to a shelter in Chinatown, where I spent almost my entire fourth grade year. The shelter had one thing going for it. Uh, it was a converted public school building that still had its library. And so I spent a lot of time in the library because we didn't have nothing else to do. Evenings and weekends, I spent reading and talking to mom. Through regular bilingual pleading with the shelter staff, mom had managed to score a very small TV, which was perpetually set to Univision. But she set rules. We could watch the noticiero, and from time to time, primer impacto, but <laughs> telenovelas were off limits. And I had to read. The shelter had a library on the top floor whose books residents were allowed to borrow on their honor. Most weekday nights, I prowled through the stacks in search of something interesting. I looked for what I thought were real books, grown-up, fact-filled books, not the bunny rabbit children's soft covers that crowded the shelves. Mm -hmm. One of the first books I checked out was a children's book on Spain. From this book, I learned not only that Spain had the highest average elevation of any country in Europe, Switzerland included, but also that weekdays in Spain were organized around the siesta. Everyone took naps right after lunch. So cool. Mom, I asked one night in our bedroom, do people in our country take siestas too? Claro, she replied. She described the siesta time in Santo Domingo, how she'd leave work and head back home to find the babysitter minding me while I napped, usually naked, on the floor of our blue house. The days were very hot, and the living room tiles were very cool. The babysitter had tried to get me to move to my bed, but mom and she had finally talked it over and decided that yes, I could sleep ass naked on the floor. <laughs> Mom explained to me that in many other respects, Spain and the Dominican Republic were very different. We spoke Spanish, but our Spanish was different. It was no tan refinado, because we peppered our sentences with dique and dropped every S we could. <laughs> Plus our patria wasn't all that far from the United States, but Spain was an ocean away in Europe. And Europe was funny because over there people spoke so many languages, not just Spanish and English, but French and Italian and Greek and Russian and Polish. The next book I borrowed from the library was a textbook called Exploring World History. After I finished reading it, I came back to mom with more questions. It was strange to me that Exploring World History and every history textbook I came across in the shelter library had so little to say about the Dominican Republic. I knew the name of our current president, Joaquin Balaguer, but who was president before him? Antes de Balaguer, she began. There was Salvador Jorge Blanco, but he was corrupt. Francisco Camaño, Antonio Inbert, Balaguer outlived them and replaced them. Before that, there was Juan Bosch, but the Americans wouldn't let him be our president. Balaguer was there, he worked on the Trujillo, and so they picked him over Bosch. Rafael Trujillo was evil. One night, mom told me the story of why her dad, Abuelo Memo, hadn't been around when she was born. Trujillo's men had beaten him and left him for dead in a ditch, all because, Dique, Abuelo had been overheard complaining about Trujillo. Memo had come to his senses, fled the country in Ayola, and spent a few years in Cuba. But what happened to him, Mom said, had also happened to a lot of men and women back then. Abuelo was lucky. He'd lived. But before Trujillo, Mom was not telling me, we were a Spanish colony. Columbus came to our island. The first university in the Americas opened up in Santo Domingo. That's the same university I went to. We were a colony until 1821, when we won our independence. But then the Haitians conquered us, and we had to fight them to regain our independence in 1844. Juan Pablo Duarte and his companion set Quisqueya free. Mom knew so much history. I was in awe. One evening, I came across a book in the shelter library titled How People Lived in Ancient Greece and Rome. I took it down from its shelf and brought it back to our room to read. Most of the front cover and the first few pages were covered in doodles and scrawls. But the opening doodle-free paragraphs of the text were set against illustrations of a man in a toga reading a scroll, a young man strumming a line, with another laurel-crowned youth looking on attentively, a black vase decorated with a band of warriors, an open scroll, a spear and shield wielding warrior, an aqueduct, fortifications, and a temple. The first few sentences grabbed my attention. Quote, Western civilization! was formed from the union of early Greek wisdom and the highly organized legal minds of early Rome. 
The Greek belief in a person's ability to use his powers of reason, coupled with Roman faith in military strength, produced a result that has come to us as a legacy or a gift from the past. This legacy has grown and blossomed into a smooth, colorful way of life, covering equally the arts and the sciences, the one and the many." End quote. My eyes were glued to the page. I hadn't had quite that same experience of intense focus when learning about the people and customs of Spain, or about the Dominican Republic's presidents. It had been fun to learn those things, and it was even more fun to know that I knew them. But this book talked about a legacy and a way of life. Those words made Greece and Rome seem much more important than anything I'd read about before. The book began with a chapter on sites in early Greece and Rome. There were maps of the Mediterranean in the time of the Roman Republic and Empire, regions shaded in blue and purple and orange that were dotted with cities whose names were familiar. Rome, because that's where the Pope lived, Mom told me. Athens, because Dad had once said to me that the most famous Greek philosophers were Athenians. And others that were unfamiliar, Corinth, Mycenae, Thebes. There were descriptions of the climate, followed closely by an end of chapter question for further thought. Do you think the locations in which these cultures developed had anything to do with the advanced nature of their civilizations? Why? So you see this book was playing a real indoctrination game. Ha ha ha. I paused for a moment, stumped. I was encouraged when I saw that one of the book's previous owners had traced a box around the why. I kept on reading about the invasions of the Persians and the domination of Athens, the Peloponnesian Wars that pitted Athens against Sparta, Alexander the Great, and his conquest of the entire known world. With the help of drawings and maps, I imagined what it would have been like to fight in Darius's army, to drink wine at a symposium while poetry was recited, to talk with philosophers. But then a recap question on page 41 left me searching for answers that I couldn't seem to find in the book itself. Quote, in a civilization such as early Greece, where man was so highly respected, why were some people made slaves and treated cruelly? Is it possible for people to act in the same way today? End quote. I'd read about slaves in library textbooks on American history. I'd come across the word discrimination and learned about its roots in slavery. In talking to mom, I learned that in Santo Domingo there had been slaves too, negros from Africa, indios from the island. The white slave owners had had children with them, black and white slave children, moreno, moreno and trigueño slave children. And that's why Dominicans now were so many different skin colors. Now I was learning that the Greeks had slaves too. All the good things that they'd done to create modern civilization, and they would had slaves. Next in my new book came the Romans. They conquered the Greeks, they conquered everyone else in the Mediterranean. I learned that kings had ruled them first and that, after the kings were kicked out, Rome had become an oligarchic republic usually headed by consuls, but also in emergencies by a dictator. The Roman dictator wasn't like a modern one. Not even Julius Caesar was like the region. And in my mind, I heard mom's favorite joke. Desde que bruto mató a César, los brutos viven sin cesar. When mom first told the joke, I laughed because I felt it was the grown-up thing to do. I didn't really get what was so funny about it. Now I got it. I read and reread the book and never returned it to the library starting a distinguished tradition of never returning books to libraries and incurring massive fines in the process. <laughs> so that section of the book discusses my, my socialization into a form and a practice of knowledge. Uh, and it became the case as I grew older that this fascination with the Greek and Roman world would begin to structure some of the choices I made and begin to mold some of the priorities I set for myself uh, in education. But that was also coupled by a different socialization, with a different socialization, and that was the socialization of being racialized. Um, and this occurred on several different registers as I was a kid and a teenager. And one of those incidents I describe in the book I'll read right now. At Resurrection, our local church in Central Harlem, Mom made a new best friend, Carmen. They met before in the PS200 playground during kindergarten dismissal. Carmen's younger son, Peter, was Yando's classmate. Yando is my younger brother. But they didn't really become close until they'd started running into each other at Resurrection and learned that they'd both grown up in Puerto Plata, where my grandparents still lived. Carmen invited mom over to her place on 147th and 7th. One day after school, mom took Yando and me to visit. While we waited for her to buzz us in, I marveled at how much nicer Carmen's building was than ours. 
The front of the building was clean, the buzzer worked, and no one was loitering on the stairs. And Carmen's apartment blew me away. She had a large TV, a true living room with real new furniture, and three bedrooms. Carmen and Mom sat down at the kitchen table to trade gossip. Then I saw Carmen move her eyes from Mom's face to mine and back again. Marielena, she half whispered, is he your son? Oh, Carmen, that's Daniel. He and Yando have the same father? Claro que si. Ah, they look different. That's why I asked. <laughs> Mom seemed completely unfazed by the question. She and Carmen went on and on about the neighborhood and how unsafe it was, how the tigres were everywhere with their pants falling to the ground, how you couldn't let the children hang out with the negros because before long your kids would start wearing their pants low and act all disrespectful. Meanwhile, I was steaming with anger. Who did Carmen think my mom was? One of those cualquieras who has kids with different men? Why didn't she think I was mom's son? Didn't we look alike? Plus, it wasn't as if she hadn't seen me before. I was usually with mom when she picked up Yando at dismissal, and I was always standing nearby whenever they bumped into each other at church. So why was she so confused? Only when we left Carmen's place to head back to Bradhurst did it finally hit me why Carmen was so confused. Carmen was light-skinned. Her children were light-skinned. Mom and Yando were light-skinned. I was black. And I didn't know many Dominicans who were as black as I was. Dad, maybe my Tio Jose. I didn't want to be so dark. I wanted my brother's wavy hair and his light skin. Race, that's, that's how it starts. That's how it starts. That's how you get marked. That is how you internalize the marking of difference. Last passage, and then we talk. So I mentioned earlier my emergent interest in classics. Uh, and when I got to college at Princeton, I decided uh, after my freshman year to think serious about majoring uh, in classics at Princeton. My friends and I had some conversations about this uh, because as one of my friends pointed out, that's some white people shit. <laughs> so I'll read this selection and then we'll talk. <laughs> it was two weeks before the final deadline for declaring majors or concentrations in Princeton speak. We always gotta use weird language to describe the choices students make. Amanda, my good friend and undergrad, and I were dawdling in front of Fritz, the campus center. Neither of us really felt like going to class. So I just don't know, she was saying. Some days I think French, other days comp lit, or politics. From the dean's office on down, the official message was that Princeton students should major in something they love and stop worrying about what might look good on a resume or in the eyes of a prospective employer. But my friends and I were all having a bit of a hard time internalizing this message. It just seemed a little preposterous to think that you could major in classics or comp lit or philosophy or romance languages and literature and then land a high paying job in finance or consulting or apply successfully to law school or med school or whatever. And having to explain to your parents that you were majoring in something so impractical, boy. But this was so much privilege neurosing and we all knew it at day's end We'd all be sporting Princeton degrees, so what was the big deal? Amanda and I had taken classes together, so I thought I had a pretty good handle on the kinds of subjects she liked most. You like reading and talking about French novels, right? Do French or comp lit? Politics. Eh. Well, I've been thinking about something, she said. Juan Jose said to me the other day. A Chicano classmate of ours, Juan Jose, everyone called him Juanjo, was beginning to make a name for himself as the Uber Latino. At the beginning of the year, he had chugged three-fourths of a bottle of tequila at a campus room party. Uh, to this day, I, was very, I, I remain very impressed by this, even though he got <laughs> really sick. There had been much vomiting afterwards. Amanda hung out with him on the regular, even though she was still with Salim, her boyfriend at the time. I suspect that she had a side crush on Juanjo, which, if true, was decisive confirmation of her taste in men, because Fool was a classic mujerier. When I told him, she said, I was thinking of majoring in French or comp lit, he was like, oh, that's that white people nonsense. He said that I have to stop acting like a white girl, that I believe minorities need to stop pretending that we were white people, that I had to major in something that would position me to make a real contribution to society after graduating. And then I, then I got angry. 
that is some BS. What the fuck is he majoring in? <laughs> politics. So joining the hordes of sophomores declaring a concentration in politics is going to prepare him to make a real contribution to society. Amanda shrugged and threw up her hands. I've been giving my leanings towards classics a lot of thought. Sure, it was some white people nonsense. There wasn't another Latino or Latina or blackface in many of the Latin and Greek classes I'd taken. But the problem I was beginning to notice wasn't the majors themselves. It was that previous schooling and preparation really shaped major choice, if you managed to make it to college in the first place. Even for those of us black and Latino kids who were lucky enough to be at Princeton, how many had been exposed to the study of Latin, Greek, or of romance literature in high school? And there was another related problem. Black and Latino kids who made it to Princeton were socialized to think that only by majoring in something practical could they properly honor their obligations to the betterment and advancement of la raza. Juan Ho's words struck me as irresponsible, on the same tip as Derek and his date black and Latino girls or else jump off. One of my friends and I have this recurring debate in college about like whether we should only date black and Latino people. Uh, because he said, you like dating white girls too much, so you need to cut that shit out. Uh, and this is another fight that is explained in another part of the book. So I said to my friend Amanda, he's on some dumb shit. Following his logic, no minority should ever major in the liberal arts. Forget that. Maybe we should pick our majors because we're excited about the classes we'll be taking. Maybe we should be like white people who major in impractical shit because they can. End quote. Decision day came. Amanda declared a major in French. I declared mine in classics with a minor in public policy. <laughs> See, I was committed to the humanistic lifestyle, but not so committed that I wouldn't draw up a contingency plan or two if for whatever reason, I couldn't hack it as a classicist. So I'm done, let's talk. Great, <laughs> Great. so thank you um, for sharing those passages with us. They were actually a lot of the ones that really resonated with me and, you know, sparks a lot of the questions that I have for you here. So one of the really, I guess, striking things that I found about the memoir is that the way that you talk about your experience is it's not as though in childhood, you know, you're kind of thinking every day about the papeles and the way in which, oh, we're undocumented. It really only comes up at certain moments. So, you know, when you have to go on this flight, um, I don't know how old you were at that time. Like, I guess around... 13. Okay, yeah. So in terms of having ID for those different moments, and I think that you really kind of get across the way in which it is this kind of purgatory or waiting that really fosters the sense of being undocumented and feeling as though you're not legitimate, but there's just this uncertainty of what your status is going to be. And, yeah, I guess I wanted you to kind of discuss that more in the sense of towards the book you have a decision to make in terms of what your lawyer um, recommends that you know you can keep waiting for the dream act to be passed you know still waiting or you can decide to take action to kind of regularize your status so i wondered if you would talk a bit about that and the way in which there is this duality in terms of what you described um, in terms of blackness in that when people see you, they probably assume, oh, he's African American, which is kind of assuming a native, quote unquote, Americanness, which, you know, even though America is the only kind of home that you really know and remember strongly, that you're being assumed to be a native of this place, and yet at the same time, you're being rejected on a daily kind of basis. So I wondered if you would sort of grapple with that and. Yeah, just what the experience was in that kind of, the way that people would read you mm -hmm. versus your status. This was one of the tensions that I tried to bring out in the book. Um, and when I sat down to reflect on what to incorporate in the book and how to bring out uh, this ambivalence that was created and engendered by my being constantly read as something that I was not quite, uh, I thought back to an incident that occurred when I was a junior in college. And it was one of these many stories that did not make it in the book. So I was taking an education policy class. Um, it was a group of 12 students. Uh, it was offered out of the Woodrow Wilson School, ha ha ha, uh, at Princeton. And every week, 
in this class we had fights. We had fights because one of the topics that was at the center of our discussions was educational equity. And you would be shocked to learn that some people don't really believe in educational equity. So we had one day a series of protracted arguments among the various students uh, that revolved around two issues. The first was affirmative action, and then the second was school funding. Now, the second uh, debate was capped by one of my classmates uh, making the statement uh, that, you know, some people are just gonna be janitors and we should be fine with having schools produce people whose end outcome in life will be to work as custodial and janitorial staff. I mean, she straight up said this and I like almost walked out of the room. But um, the first conversation about affirmative action was revealing because in the course of this conversation, it emerged that people really had a hard time coming to grips publicly and explicitly with the fact that they are racial scripts according to which our bodies are read. And when I intervened at one point in the conversation to say, look, I walk in these spaces and people will read me uh, as black and they will marshal a constellation of associations that revolve around that. One of my classmates was like, really? You feel that way all the time? I was like, oh man, like how much do I have to explain to you about how like the epidermal and uh, the spectral dimensions of race work? Like, I mean, what, what, how much more work do I have to do for you? But it was also difficult to give this kind of subjectively embodied experience expression in ways that could persuade those who were not inhabiting those bodies to rethink their orientation towards black bodies. So on the affirmative action front, there is an incident I describe in the book that left a pretty deep mark on me. Uh, and I discuss it in the final chapter devoted to my high school year. So despite all this anxiety about being undocumented, uh, anxiety that ultimately pushed me to confide the details of my status to my college guidance counselor, I ended up with his encouragement applying early decision to Princeton. Uh, and after I was admitted, I was riding high for weeks. I was so ecstatic. Uh, my boy Derek and I like wore sweatshirts with our respective universities because he'd gotten into, he'd gotten into Brown early. And one night we came across this dude who was jogging up at the Upper East Side and was wearing an NYU shirt. And we were assholes. We were like, oh, look at this clown. And why you, right? We were straight up assholes. I wasn't going to bring it up. Yeah. yeah the uh, I mean, but then, a few days later, I was riding the school elevator uh, with one of my classmates. Uh, and this classmate, who came from a very privileged white background, was complaining about his um, difficulty securing admission to the college of his choice, which is Cornell. And he spoke very openly about how his parents' connections had not made this possible for him. And I was just sort of ignoring him because, you know, I was like, you know, this privileged dude is complaining, I don't care, blah, blah, blah. But then he turned to me on our way up to AP Bio and he said, but it must have been so easy for you because of this. And he like actually pinched his skin straight up. So when this happened, my first reflex was, I have to snuff this dude, I have to snuff him so bad. Like, how could he do this? But then I recognized, if I stuff this dude, I'm definitely gonna get thrown out of school. And, and then all the happy things will be taken away from me, uh, just like that. What left a mark on me about that incident was not only uh, being interpolated in this way, right? Being told uh, that my admission had been largely a function of my skin color, right? And I mean, of course I could have, and I later did, generate a critique of that position that said, oh yeah, like, if it was just for my skin color, then that is totally fine because of how structural inequality works in this country. But at the time, the other thing that kept coming to me uh, was this realization that I had in the course of my own high school career and after my high school career, capitulated to a discourse that centered my worth on the premise that I had this merit that had distinguished me as a student and that all of the good things that were coming my way were a function of that accrued merit. Um, and capitulating to that discourse came with its own problems, right? Among others, this discourse presented me with a fantasy. And this fantasy was that 
by virtue of working my ass off and getting high grades, blah, 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 I could escape certain scripts that were being imposed on me. I could escape the script of being undocumented. I could escape the script of being read as a black presence in white spaces, all this stuff. And what I came to realize, as, as the memoir describes, is that, oh no, like you, you could do all this and you, you cannot escape those scripts. So the key is to, to devise ways of applying pressure to those scripts and to contribute to the task of disarticulating and fragmenting those scripts. But the idea, the fantasy that one could escape those was in the end a fantasy that proved unsustainable. Right? Yeah, and I mean, this is something that obviously doesn't just end in high school mm -hmm. having to deal with this guy, but it continues onto the college campus and you talk about that in your college experience. So disclaimer, I also attended <laughs> Princeton mm -hmm. during this time and know what it's like to be black at Princeton, et cetera. But, I was teaching there um, last year in the Department of African American Studies, and this was during a time when there were um, protests on campus, you know, regarding the legacy of Woodrow Wilson, and a group of students um, joined together to form um, an organization called the Black Justice League. So I think this is just before you had mm -hmm. started again at Princeton um, as a faculty member, but a lot of what they were calling for was. Um, saying that admittance does not equal acceptance. So a lot of what they felt was not being welcome by even the architecture of the space that Princeton creates. And I guess I was wondering if you would speak a bit about what that kind of, how that reson reson resonates with you as far as admit admittance not equaling acceptance. Because I'm particularly drawn to um, the cover of your book and the way that you use this, this stamp on it, right? Because it says admitted on it. And for those of us who have, you know, navigated the immigration system from back when it was INS to becoming the Department of Homeland Security, et cetera, there is a particular power that these stamps have in terms of our relationship to the state. So I wondered if you would just talk about how that might speak to you. Mm -hmm. So I have all kinds of thoughts to this question, which could, uh, and thoughts that could carry me into an hour-long disquisition. But um, so early on during my time at Princeton, um, I had, as I mentioned earlier, like tried to indulge this fantasy of being able to escape certain kinds of scripts. But I was intent on creating another kind of. Uh, of world for myself uh, with the help of my friends. And this was a world in which we could chill out and watch Chappelle and talk Chappelle all day one moment and do all the weed we wanted and at the same time like really kick butt in school and like leave no doubt whatsoever that uh, we were the best of the best. So at the end of my freshman year, and talk about how I got this letter from Princeton uh, in the mail. And I, I freaked out when this letter showed up. My mom was like, there's a letter for you from Princeton. It's like from the, the dean of the college. And I was like, oh my god, what did I do? This is not going to be go. This is not going to end well. What happened? And so I opened this letter, um, and I, I started to cry, because the letter said that I had been uh, awarded the Freshman First Honor Prize, which is the award for academic excellence given to one freshman uh, at the conclusion of his or her freshman year. And I was real hype about this. You know, the letter said, yeah, keep that a secret. But I was like, no, I'm gonna tell my friends. Like, screw that. <laughs> and so I told one of my friends, one of my best friends, uh, who was a Latino kid, also born outside the US, who had undocumented folk in his family, uh, although he had a green card by that point, um, who had gone to high school with me. Uh, we were tight as we could be. And I told him I won this prize. And he said, that's great, but no one's going to believe that you deserve this prize. And I was like, why? He was like, because you quote rap songs all the time. And you just act a clown all, all over the place. And I was like, I don't, you know, I, I, my response was, I don't care, right? But I, I mean, I, I was hurt by that. Um, and it took me a while to process the implications of that statement. Um, because what he was saying was that, I would be presented with this prize and people would be like, ah, 
yeah, maybe he deserved that, but like maybe this is an affirmative action thing again, or like who knows, right? And, and so I mean, this was an opportunity to critique some of this merit discourse that I was I was referencing earlier, but also an opportunity to reflect on how I had internalized certain assumptions that now needed to be uh, worked through and demystified. And also, it was an occasion to reflect on the fact that like maybe some of my friends were haters. Like I, I mean, you know, like that that too was potentially in play, right? <laughs> But what really hammered this home for me, uh, and what really made me aware of the degree to which I might not be welcome uh, at Princeton, uh, was a conversation that took place sophomore fall, like not that long after I'd been presented uh, with this prize. I, at the time, had this habit with my friends of going from food study break to food study break all over the university. Like we would. We would like hunt down these opportunities for free food and we would just go. And then we would like collect all this free food and bring it back to our room. And like this was a, we would like have, we would create calendars, like try to track these out. It was crazy. This was before Google Calendar. We had it all systematized. So during one of these events, we went to one of the residential colleges at Princeton and I fell into a conversation with a person I knew. She uh, and I had gotten to know each other during our freshman year. And I was, I was kind of feeling her at that point. You know, I, I, I thought she was really cool, you know. But then we started, for some reason, to talk about immigration in the United States, uh, possibly because I was thinking of taking an immigration class being offered out of the Woodrow Wilson School. And it turned out that she was like the most anti-immigrant person ever. <laughs> like, she was like, not only was she anti-immigrant, but she really disliked illegal aliens, right? And so in this conversation, it emerged that she thought illegal aliens were like the worst of the worst. I mean, she said that at one point. You know, she was like, they take everyone's jobs. I was like, everyone, what? You know? and, but here was when I had this, I was confronted with an opportunity to leverage my own experience. But I didn't want to do that because that would mean like opening up about my undocumented status. And I wasn't ready for that game yet. So what did I do? I like summoned all of this all of this factual material at my disposal. Like I began talking in the language of economics. I talked about uh, the the economic aporte of like uh, of the undocumented. Blah 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 blah. I was like quoting all this data to her, but like that didn't do anything because she was she was dead set. She was ideologically pre-committed, and that was that. And so it occurred to me at that moment uh, that yes, there would be the lack of welcome from people uh, who had, for any number of reasons, come to think that people of my background uh, were simply not worth admission to America or even admission to Princeton. I mean, she would have tripped out major if she had found out at that moment that I'd been admitted to Princeton. But it also, at the same time that I had that uh, thought crossing my mind, I was also beginning to appreciate that it would take far more than just this data at my disposal to make a persuasive argument for restructuring uh, the ideological pre-commitments of folks like her. And that this argument would also have to operate at scale, right? It, wouldn't, it couldn't stop at the one person whom I had to persuade. It would have to extend to a pretty systemic critique of the institutions that were responsible for incubating this kind of behavior. Because let's face it, why was she in a position to like continue holding on to these views? Because at Princeton, she had not had any pressure applied to these views because the institution affirmed her in her essential convictions about it. And so this made it clear that there was an institutional responsibility to be discharged at some point that sought not that would work not only to create a better or sort of more receptive or more amenable uh, culture for folks like me, but that would actually put significant pressure on individuals to revisit and reevaluate how they thought about immigrants. And that, that's the task that needs to be fulfilled at Princeton now. And that, that is still very ongoing. And the same could be said for any number of institutions of higher education as well. Great. And I guess I wanted to kind of go back to the first selection that you read and the way in which you talked about this kind of connection that you were seeing between slavery as an institution, as far as the Greeks and Romans, and the history of the Dominican Republic, which was in a lot of ways, I guess, sort of shrouded in a sort of silence or absence. Um, and even thinking about the fact that you know, you are removed from this kind of home or motherland, in a sense. So would you, I guess, oh yeah, and the other thing was that before we began, we talked about, or we listened to um, Joe Arroyo, the Afro-Colombian singer's song, Rebellion, where he talks about, you know, this chorus of esclavitud perpetua. And we also heard Miguel's song where he says, what's normal anyway? So I wondered if you would kind of address 
that issue of blackness and of slavery and how that perhaps plays a role in the research that you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot recently about this monumental structure in the colonial zone in Santo Domingo. Uh, there's a huge statue, a 15 meter high statue, uh, that of Fray Anton de Montesinos. And this statue uh, was set up in the 80s. It was a gift to the Dominican government um, uh, from the Mexican government. Uh, it was sculpted by uh, a Mexican artist. And it commemorates this episode uh, that occurred early in the history of the colony of Santo Domingo, uh, this uh, homily that was delivered in December of 1511 uh, by Anton de Montesino. So what was this homily? Uh, there were many clerics at that point who were transiting through Santo Domingo um, with uh, the armies of the conquistadores, and some of these clerics were really uncomfortable at the sight of the exploitation of indigenous communities on the island. And eventually, they had a conversation, and they entrusted Montesinos with delivering a homily uh, the third Sunday of Advent uh, that would criticize the people in the colony who were responsible for the exploitation of indigenous communities on the island to their face. Right, and so. Montesinos took a text from the Gospel of John, John 1.23, uh, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. And he delivered this homily uh, in which he attacked the people in the audience um, for mistreating and abusing and exploiting uh, the Indios on the island. And at one point he very famously asked them, uh, are they not men? Do they not have rational souls? And so see here we see Creek, not just gospel language, but also Aristotelian language, the rational souls bit being a nod in the direction of Aristotle. So why does this episode in Montesinos' career matter? Um, it matters because first it was preserved for us by Bartolome de las Casas. Um, and Bartolome de las Casas was in attendance that day and was convinced by Montesinos to become the defender of the Indians, as he later came to be called. But De Las Casas made a pact with the devil that had pretty nasty long-term consequences. Over the course of his many years defending the cause of indigenous communities, he was prepared to accept and even justify the importation of black labor from West Africa as an offset to the indigenous labor that he wanted to see withdrawn from circulation. He wanted these indigenous communities uh, to be restored to well-being, even as they were ravaged by epidemics over the course uh, of the long 16th century. But he was totally okay with importing slaves, right? And he doesn't revisit this until near the very end of his life. I mean, at near the end of his life, he realizes that this was not a good idea. Uh, but by then, it's too late. You know, the, 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 the first wave of the slave trade is, is underway. Well, this matters now because over the past few years, there's been like a really intense revisiting and reappropriation of Montesino. So I mentioned that you know this huge statue got set up in the 1980s. In 2011, uh, the 500th anniversary of Montesino's homily was celebrated in the Dominican Republic, and there were all these speeches. It's like only Dominicans can, you know, giving these like long, long speeches extolling Montesino's as this beacon of light in the new world who had come to the defense of indigenous communities or whatever. And what was really striking about these speeches. Uh, was that in the case of those that were delivered uh, by members of the clergy uh, in Santo Domingo and in other cities in the Dominican Republic, the emphasis was on using Montesinos' sermon as a call for social justice, right? And saying that what we need now more than ever uh, is to revisit how Dominicans treat people in the Dominican Republic, including, uh, and this is where some of these bishops got into a little bit of trouble with politicians, Dominicans of Haitian descent. Dominicans who are read as being of Haitian descent, and Haitian immigrants and their children. So while all this is taking place, and while a meaningful discussion begins to happen about the interface of the Dominican Republic's own immigration system with forms of exploitation and enslavement, something is occurring in the vicinity of this statue of Montesinos. And when it actually went down, I was like, I need to write like a whole book on this, because this, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Has anyone heard of the name Josef Wesolowski? Uh, Wesolowski was the papal nuncio to the Dominican Republic uh, until it was reported that he had been engaging in the practice of picking up little boys, uh, usually Haitian orphans, and have paying these boys, or in some cases forcing these boys, to perform sex acts on him. Where? 
on the beachfront in the vicinity of the Montesino statue. The New York Times article pointed out that one of the many disturbing features of this episode, apart from the fact that it involved this pedophiliac nuncio, was that this nuncio was really obsessed with Montesinos, to the point of like actually initiating some of the sexual abuse and exploitation in the direct line of sight of the statue, like where one of the incidents occurred was right in the line of sight of the statue. And this ushered in this whole conversation about the interface of enslavement and exploitation and appropriation of the classical past in Montesinos in the Dominican Republic. But while all of this is taking place, guess what also is happening in the Dominican Republic? Starting with a reinterpretation of law in 2013, new legislation is implemented that systematically discriminates against Dominicans of Haitian descent in terms of documentation, right? So this is where I find myself coming back to often uh, to the responsibilities that we have as members of the Dominican diaspora, as members of immigrant diasporas, and as people in the academy, right? Like we have the resources, uh, intellectual and otherwise, to begin to mount critiques of how uh, institutions such as Dominican governmental institutions undertake this kind of work of oppression. But in order to do that work, we need to think about the interface of history uh, with economics and with race. Uh, and having these conversations with the Dominican Republic is still a tough thing, because a lot of Dominicans still think that they're indios. Uh, and if you call them negro, they would be like, yo, what are you doing? Like, so the fact that there is this negrophobia, the fact that there is this fear of, as Pedro Enrique Sureña turned it, ennegrecimiento. Like, I mean, these are things that have to be worked out. Um, and they have to be worked out not only in the Dominican Republic, but throughout the global north and the global south, because the leg legacies of enslavement and the psychic powers asserted through enslavement are still with us. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to follow up on that question and of this negrophobia that you described, you talk um, within the book about how the worst insult at school when you were going to school, I think in Harlem, was a quote unquote Haitian booty scratcher. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just something about the sort of proximity if you think about Hispaniola and the island of the Dominican Republic and Haiti, where I guess I would like you to grapple with why it is that that is the worst insult that someone could be called mm -hmm. and how that maybe made you feel in um, you shared with us the passage to do with colorism and your mother's friend. So if you could mm -hmm. say a bit about that. So one of the, I recognize this only after I um, started making friends through Prep for Prep, which is a program I did in New York City um, when I was in the sixth and seventh grades. So I, I was asking some folks who were also in the program, we were like collecting disses, and some of, some of my friends were very proficient at the arts of dissing. But, in their schools, like even in schools where there were, in the public schools in Brooklyn from which they hailed, where there were not that many Dominicans, being called a Haitian booty scratcher was like the worst insult there too. Like I mean, there was this very specific window in the late 90s where there was a diss, uh, like a really powerful diss. Why? Uh, because we have seen and will continue to see within moments of diasporic transformation, where you have several diasporic communities hailing from particular regions of the world, this effort within diasporic and across diasporic communities to enforce certain parameters of status and distinction. Uh, and this enforcement took aim squarely at those Haitians that were felt to be or perceived to be somehow the lowest of the low on the totem pole that emerges. But this totem pole is constituted in part by the assertion of white power, right? So the way this works is that communities that present themselves or assert themselves as having a greater claim to whiteness of a kind, think all these like light-skinned Dominicans who pretend that there are no black people in, in their family backgrounds, um, then say, ah, we, we are white. And then these other people who happen to be darker, oh, no, they, they are further down because they, they represent um, what uh, cannot be full-on whiteness. They can't even aspire to that. Look at their skin, look at their habits, look at this language. With Haitians, the other issue was, of course, that, um, look, they don't even speak Spanish. They don't even speak French. But these kinds of disses begin to be structured into school environments uh, in all kinds of unexpected and unanticipated ways. So when I go to this private school on the Upper West Side, at first, one might think, you know, there are like two or three people of color in every grade. Racial dynamics are gonna be qualitatively different. 
uh, they are going to take on a different aspect. But one day I was having a conversation uh, with uh, one of my classmates uh, who was in my French class. And he said, you speak French like a Haitian. Now, how did this dude know how Haitians talk? Like, I mean, no, he could, come on. Uh, and what struck me was that I felt really wounded by that. Right, so like when I revisited that episode in my mind, I was like, so what, what was it about my internalization uh, of shame uh, that reflected the operations of this system of supremacy on me, right? And when my classmate realized that this had irked me, he did the thing that we always did when we were in high school, which was keep saying it over and over again. I mean, so now, now you get into another dimension of this, which is like how repetition works to structure the phenomenology of race, right? So like he just kept saying, he was like, you speak French like a hate. And then I would be like, you need to shut the fuck up. Like that. And he would be like, ah, you got upset, ha, 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 right? But like, I couldn't even at that point get to the point where I could deconstruct this effectively uh, because I had to work through my own affective response, which is one of equal parts shame and rage, right? Um, and this, this texturing of the lived experience, uh, of the lived diasporic experience, as it relies upon, as it mobilizes uh, the ghosts of racial encounter and racial uh, subordination, uh, was very much a feature of my time uh, in high school and beyond in these in immigrant communities in New York. Great, thank you. And I guess my final question, and we'll open it up to the audience, is could you tell us a bit about, I guess, where you are with everything today? Because as I said, everything is very unresolved. We can think about the current moment, but maybe you could talk a bit about your journey to England and the whole process and sort of dilemma that you found yourself in yeah. being there. So in 2006, after the Wall Street Journal uh, profile came out, I had this choice of staying in the United States or heading out of the United States. Um, I had been lucky to receive a fellowship for postgraduate study in the UK, uh, but one of the things I had discovered in consultation with my lawyer was that leaving the United States would subject me to a 10-year bar on re-entry uh, because I had overstayed uh, the visa on which I had entered for over 180 days. I should note, uh, for those of you interested in matters immigration historical, that the law that was responsible for the implementation of this 10-year bar was signed in 1996 uh, under Clinton. And this law imposed penalties that have since not been lifted uh, and whose overcoming is exceedingly hard. So I left the United States. Even with the prospect of the bar staring at me at my face, um, I decided that having come out as an undocumented immigrant, there was no real option to adjust, uh, and the DREAM Act had by that point been stalled multiple times in Congress. Uh, so I figured I just gotta go. I came back in only because of two factors. The first was that I was offered a job uh, that came uh, with the possibility of an H-1B worker visa. But for that job, I had to apply for what's called a waiver of inadmissibility. Uh, because I was subject to the 10-year bar, I had to persuade a US Embassy and the State Department uh, that I should not have the 10-year bar imposed on me. But the second factor, uh, and the reason why this waiver was eventually approved, has to do with another Clinton. One of the politicians who, in the aftermath of the Wall Street Journal profile, had taken an interest in my case and had really determined to help me out was the then Senator, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and her office uh, and the Senator wrote uh, to the US Embassy and to the State Department asking that their discretion be exercised in my favor. And even though this waiver took a long time to approve, it was eventually approved, and we had the senator's office to thank. Because, as my lawyer once joked on the phone, if it hadn't for her, there was no way you could get this waiver. Uh, we had tried to see if the waiver might be issued uh, for a tourist visa. I had gone to the US Embassy in London in the fall of 2006 and submitted a visa application to re-enter the United States to see my family for the holidays. And that joint was denied real fast. Like, the visa officer looked at me like I was crazy. She was like, you know you're subject to the 10-year bar, right? It was like I wasted my time and money, you know? After I was let back into the United States, though, uh, I made another discovery, uh, thanks to a consultation with my lawyer. Uh, I had this work visa, and I really wanted to go to graduate school. Well, you can't go to graduate school full-time on an H-1B visa. So I had to transition visa statuses. 
This was where we embarked on a plan that did not have any guarantee of success. In fact, we learned, uh, thanks to his firm's research, uh, that uh, the odds of an application along the lines we envisioned being approved were almost next to nil. Uh, this was to change my visa status from H-1B to F-1, the correct student visa category, but remaining in the U.S. the entire time the change of status was processed. So I would not head out of the country to obtain an F-1. And there was a very simple, pragmatic reason for this, which was that if I had headed out of the country, I would have been subject to the 10-year bar again and would have had to reapply for the waiver. But this time, because of the visa category in question, I would have been subjected to a special test. Uh, the test is the non-immigrant intent test that is applied to F-1Bs, uh, F-1s. And there was no way I would have passed this test because I had family in the United States. My mom was in the United States, my younger brother was in the United States. Clearly, I had, I, an officer would say I had intent to immigrate long-term to the United States. So I would fail the test, be denied the visa, not get the, ten -year waiver, the, the waiver for the 10-year bar, and be stuck outside the US. So we tried to do this in the US, and fortunately, it worked out. Uh, so what happened after that? Well. I went to graduate school, and after graduate school, I had a work authorization. Uh, but work authorizations on F1s expire, uh, and you can't renew them indefinitely. You gotta give that up eventually. By that point, my long-term girlfriend and I had decided that we wanted to get married, and I proposed to her in December of 2013. We got married in March 2015, and then she, as a US citizen, put together a spousal petition on my behalf. She filed it May 2015, and then we heard nothing for almost a year. And when we did hear from the service, and they called us in for an interview, they really wanted to know how bona fide this marriage was, right? <laughs> and we, we passed that test, uh, although uh, Missy burst into laughter when I was asked if I'd ever killed someone. Uh, she thought this was like the funniest question ever. And she was like irrepressibly laughing. <laughs> I was like, obviously this officer is gonna like fail all of us on this one. Uh, and she laughed again when I was asked if I had ever received advanced weapons training. Mm -hmm. These are real questions, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. <laughs> so after this interview, we were told, and this is where we come to another perversity of the immigration system. Uh, we were told at the conclusion of the interview that everything had gone fine uh, and that we should be hearing uh, with a decision uh, within about two weeks or so. Oh, but we did not hear with, uh, from them with a decision in two weeks, nor after a month, nor after two, nor after three. Finally, we get a letter from them, and it says that the service had determined that I was still subject to the 10-year bar. So, in order to demonstrate uh, that I should be granted relief from the 10-year bar and allowed to adjust a permanent residency, I had to submit another application. Uh, and this application was a demonstration that my being denied permanent residency would constitute a form of extreme hardship uh, for my US citizen spouse. These extreme hardship applications are hard to pull off successfully. And I was warned by my lawyer that, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is where your luck comes to an end. You know, this is a wrap. Um, eventually it was approved, huh? It was approved on January the 24th. Uh, in what I think was a visa, uh, a, a immigration officer's bit of civil disobedience. Um, uh, and the green card then finally showed up two months later after having been posted to the wrong address. <laughs> so that's how it ends. That's how it ends. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. So yeah, congratulations. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm actually going through this right now in terms of the waiting and waiting, and I feel like that's such a big part of it. So thank you for sharing with us. All right, so we'll open it up to some questions that you guys might have. Yeah, and if you can I'm just say to, your name. Just before I introduce myself, I'm glad that I took your email because I'll send it to you. Q&A is going to be short. But I wrote down four things. Minority, I'm a literary genealogist. And you check, blacks are not minorities in this world. The Chinese, the Indians, and everybody that came out of Africa are all the same. How can you be a minority? Stop using that word. Mm -hmm. Well, you Sessions, actually, you talk about Mr. demography Sessions, at the Sessions, end of the book, right? I sent a letter, which I'm going to send you a copy, 
when he talked about the guy in the little island in the Pacific, mm -hmm. I just said the same type of letter, but you were low to him and reminded him of certain things. I would love that. It would be great. No, I mean, I, this is something I discussed. The, the minority bit is the site for a critique of optimism, shall we say, uh, that comes to the very conclusion of the book. Because I try to make a case uh, by rhetorical sleight of hand uh, for a vision of the future in which those of us who are minorities will be in the ascendant, uh, and we will be able to reconfigure uh, these politics uh, to our liking. But this optimism is tinged with, well, a pragmatist, uh, somewhat less optimistic assessment of the current state of affairs. And this touches on something that we had uh, discussed right before uh, the conversation uh, tonight got underway, which is that as we have seen over the past two centuries of America's immigration history in particular, groups that are subjected uh, to v structural violence tend, upon being granted some form of emancipatory relief, to embrace forms of structural violence against other groups. Uh, and this is part of the habituation to white supremacy business. Uh, white supremacy works in part by a divide and conquer strategy that relies on precisely this form of capture. Right? And so there is this vision at the end of the book uh, of demography ultimately running wild uh, and uh, to invoke my favorite comedian Dave Chappelle, turning us all beige one day. Right? Uh, but we also know that uh, white supremacy is uh, very plastic and pliable, and labile, and slippery to pin down. Uh, and with each generation and across so many different groups, white supremacy's institutional rubrics function to organize, even as emancipatory projects are underway, new systems for institutional oppression. And so that, that is the challenge I see. Uh, not just engaging in a kind of linguistic critique in which we train ourselves to avoid using certain terms that we inscribe uh, this power, not just even in the aspirational tactics uh, of embracing a future that uh, preaches, that valorizes uh, the centrality of our numbers to redefining the body politic, but in amounting no less than a full-scale assault on the many instantiations of white supremacy. Uh, and how they affect all of these different groups, including whites themselves, uh, could we be in a position to actually make substantive progress, right? Yeah, so. because even, I mean, that rhetoric, as funny it is, as it is of beigeness, is a kind of form mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. white supremacy in terms of a kind of future or futurity, mm -hmm. right? Great, so other questions that you guys have? Mm -hmm. And if you can just say your name and where you're coming from. Yeah. So this gets back to one of the questions that you put on the table earlier uh, that had to do in part with how one realizes that one is undocumented. So I came to the U.S. when I was four, and I came on a tourist visa that expired not too long after we had come. Uh, now, one of the things I remember, and I describe briefly in the book, is the conversations my parents had uh, about trying to figure things out, right? Because they determined after my mom uh, had been released from a hospital following uh, medical complications she had after my brother's birth, that they didn't want to stay. They wanted to stay in New York City and try to figure something out. But they didn't know how to do this. Um, and so they, they asked. They started asking people. Uh, they asked friends of friends in Washington Heights uh, and in Astoria. And then they were directed to a dude who promised to help them. Uh, and we all know where this goes because this dude took my parents' money and just ghosted. You know, he was straight up ghosted. 
And he was not to be found until I tracked him down many years later. And that conversation was real fun. Uh, oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there were many, many pleasant things said uh, during this conversation. Um, so at that point, I had begun to sense that there was something that was causing my parents incredible amounts of stress. So I, I couldn't actually verbalize fully what that would have meant. I mean, I was, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. Where I first had a real palpable sense of the limitations uh, that came with being undocumented and of what being without papel is like substantively translated to occurred at two separate moments not that far removed from each other in time. One, I would often go with my mom uh, to her meetings with a public assistance case manager. Uh, so uh, after we were, after we entered the shelter system, uh, we spent a great deal of time in public assistance offices, um, uh, practicing the kinds of waiting uh, that would then become a fixture of my immigrant experience, right? And my mom had questions for our public assistance uh, case manager. She wanted to know why it was that the only person eligible for benefits was my younger brother. Uh, and so, I explained what the case manager told me when I translated this question uh, into English, that my younger brother was the only person eligible for benefits because he was a US citizen. Uh, and neither my mom nor I had status, uh, so we could not receive benefits. He received, my mom received the benefits on his behalf, uh, but that was it. So I was, I, then I realized, okay, you know, this, there's something about our not having papeles that like affects our Getting public uh, right, it was like seven, eight, right? But then when it really hit home was when my mom's dad died. Uh, so Abuelo Memo, when he passed away, I was 11, about to turn 12. And my mom found out from one of her sisters and she spent the entire evening crying on the phone with each of her five sisters. And uh, she said at one point, you know, I'm so sorry that I can't go back. And you know, after she got off the phone, I was like, well, why can't we go back? When are we gonna go for the funeral? And then she started crying all over again, and I felt really bad for having to ask that, at which point she explained to me that we couldn't travel, because if we headed outside the United States without papeles, we would not be allowed back in. So those, these were the episodes, right? And I mean, this gets to a bigger question, of course, about how the subjectivity of the undocumented immigrant is created, right? I mean, this gets back to the uh, point raised in the introduction about the impossible subjecthood of the undocumented. And one of the many axes along which that subject is crafted is in the sort of episodic epiphanous uh, junctures where you realize, oh snap, this is a constraint. And this constraint has to do with my not having papeles, right? Because yeah, I mean, there is a way in which you can leave, but you just know that you would not be able to come back. Right. And it means that you can ex exist here, but it sort of just stays there, right? Okay, so one more question, yeah. So this, I mentioned earlier that you know there was like this um, anxiety about the scripts that were performed on me. And when I was younger, I really felt out of place in a lot of Dominican settings. Um, and I felt out of place like for all kinds of reasons. So some of them had to do with my internalization of what made someone be like the real, real Dominican, right? <laughs> so. I was like an okay bachata dancer, but I was like a great bachata dancer. And like here, I thought, here I thought my, my younger brother, who you know was born in, in the city, had actually like figured this all out because he he was like always the best dancer, uh, and and he had this knack. I spoke in this. Mom was like obsessed with her boy speaking like really proper now Spanish, right? She was like, "You're not gonna talk like the other Dominicans. I'm not here. It's, it's a wrap for you. Like, don't do that." <laughs> my brother is um, more resistant to these kinds of expressions than I would. And so he, what he would do is he would we'd be hanging out with other Dominican families. And my brother is a great mimic. He has like a phenomenal ear. Um, and so he would, he would imitate different dialects from VR based on conversations he was having with people. And he would just like start talking like a Sivaeño to my mom. And my mom would be like, how, why are you talking like this? <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I felt when I was younger that, it, even though as I discussed in the book, my brother had all these issues with being compared to me, I felt that I was always 
also being compared to him in a sense, uh, especially along this axis of Dominican identity, right? But what really stood out for me most of all was that there were very few people in my family who were as dark as I was. I mean, like, people were dark, right? And like, my dad is really dark. Uh, Wesley Snipes dark, uh, to, to channel Chappelle once again. Uh, but I felt out of place, especially on my mom's side, uh, where there were a lot of people who were much lighter. Uh, one of the people, one of the few people uh, who was attuned to these racial dynamics, even though she was at times complicit in their perpetuation and reproduction, was my mom. Because my mom is the darkest skin of her sisters, and when she was growing up, she was called Negra de Mierda all the time. Like, all the time. Like, by her mom, by her aunts. I mean, this was like how she grew up. And so she said to me one day, I had like had this conversation with her when I was a teenager, and I, I, I felt really uncomfortable around some of our relatives. And you know, she said, like, I, I want you to know that what happened to me is something that never should happen to you. And I will do everything I can to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. But you should know that all of this stuff that you hear should never define you, and you should never allow it to define you. And that conversation like blew me away because I was busy half the time fighting my mom over whether I could wear baggy jeans. But like, I mean, here she was like recognizing that there was something that was so salient in my experience with Dominicanness, and like actually interposing and saying, "Look, this happened to me, and I want you to realize that this is not what reckons you know. This is not what makes you." Uh, so yeah. Great. Um, yeah, okay, we'll take one final question, or we'll combine the two, so you can go ahead and then in the back. We'll Whoa, are you that. rocking Weehawken? <laughs> that? Weehawken. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Brandon McLaughlin, and I'm from, um, well, I go to school at NJCU, and um, I was just wondering if you think that with the newer generations that like racism is calming down or is getting worse? Uh, calming down. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, well, or what I, can we combine yeah, we'll, like, we'll, we'll combine it, because we'll I have like all kinds of thoughts yeah. on that. But yeah, we'll combine <laughs> it with the, with the other okay. question. Um, I think you have a different perspective as an immigrant educational setting that I teach in. I'm in a uh, course called Tech Age So I guess, the, I mean, the two questions are kind of related then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, so I just uh, finished teaching Du Bois' uh, Souls of Black Folk, uh, which I love teaching, to this course um, of students uh, enrolled in a class on citizenship. And I'm bringing up Du Bois because one of the opening moments of Souls of Black Folk is his description of when he first realized that he was other. And it occurred in elementary school. Uh, and the scene, as he lays it out, uh, involves students exchanging cards with each other and his attempting to exchange a card uh, with a female student in his class, and she denies him with a stare. And it's this moment uh, that makes him uh, begin to understand that he is somehow different from the others. 
uh, a realization that is then reiterated and repeated over the years to come, and that leaves this mark on him that he is at pains to anatomize in this opening chapter of Souls of Black Folk. So I bring this up to underscore how important it is to start uh, at the elementary school level. Uh, so in the fall, I, I Skyped into a third grade classroom, and I should put you in touch with the teacher who was responsible for organizing the Skype call, because she at her school uh, in Brooklyn had uh, really been working hard with her other co with her colleagues to set up a curriculum uh, for the elementary schoolers to try to get them to talk about what it meant to be Latino Latina, what it meant to be African American, right? Um, but one of the issues that they were trying to work out, um, and one that I find myself constantly revisiting, um, is how to design curricula that do not simply conjure up the specter of triumphalism, right? So, yay, like, we're different, and that's cool, because like now we all get along and we recognize that we're different. I mean, how do you communicate, even to, to elementary age children, that the reproduction of difference in our society is like one of like the salient issues of our time because of how destructive the reproduction of difference has been, right? And no one wants to be the elementary school teacher who says like, you are all gonna be terrible to each other in a few years. Like once you like fully fully internalize the codes that you use in order to deploy this, but like th this has to start at the elementary school level because like otherwise like we get into this Du Boisian scenario in which people experience the trauma and then without being able to verbalize the trauma have to spend all of these years trying to figure out what happened to me then like why why did this leave a mark on me the way that it did right I've given more thought to this on the on the high school and middle school level partly because it's like in some ways easier right I mean I I had written this short piece for the Times last year in which I argued that like we need far more attention uh, to migratory narratives in high school education, uh, and that we need to substantially up our incorporation of migratory narratives and our study of immigration in the long term uh, as a feature of history curricula at the high school level. But I mean, there would be ways, of course, to think about how this might be done at the middle school and even at the elementary school level as well. Uh, the trick is to do so in a way that will not infuriate all of the parents uh, who will come, uh, who will come to you, who will come to you and say, "What on earth is it that you're telling my children about?" Uh, say the the pernicious effects of institutional racism. Or I, I mean, like this is this is, I think, one of the the challenges to grapple with, and I don't have a, a any, any clearly formed thoughts on this yet. In response to your question. Um, who So, among the people who read the book uh, were my parents-in-law. And my, my wife uh, comes from uh, a middle-class white background. Uh, she grew up in towns that were 97% and 95% white, respectively. Uh, Fairport, New York, and then Sparta, New Jersey. And her parents were very much uh, adult products of these towns and these segregated landscapes, right? But they've always welcomed me, me note the emphasis on me, uh, with, with, well, yeah, the, the special one, with, with warmth, uh, and they've always been really loving, right? Well, guess who they voted for in the past election? <laughs> And when, when my wife and her brother found out, I mean, they, I mean, they like excoriated their parents on the phone, like shit got real tense, <laughs> like, you know. But, and I told Missy, I'm not that surprised because I know how these exceptionalist narratives work. And so this gets me now to answering your question. Have things gotten better? Well, to the degree that people are not being lynched in the thousands, then, then, then maybe. I, but I mean, we have police killings all the time and all that. And we have the reintroduction of this like immigration enforcement apparatus that is the counterpart of the carceral state, right? I mean, they, these two parts, these are conjoined. Um, they, they actually learn from each other and they are generating profit off bodies that are subject, subjected and funneled through these systems. But I bring up the example of my parents-in-law to point out something, uh, which is that over the past 10, 15 years, there has been an efflorescence of immigrant narratives uh, that have received, that have come to publication um, and that have attained circulation, that have been read, that have been discussed, that have been processed. And yet, even for people who are introduced to these narratives and who are made aware of the power of these narratives 
there is still this gap that must be clear uh, between empathizing with the one person uh, around whom the narrative is structured, the one person who could be easily pigeonholed into an exceptionalist trajectory, and the many others who are deserving of human empathy and consideration and justice, right? And this is the gap that I think needs to be clear for things to like actually substantively get better, right? Uh, so my answer to you is an equivocation. Uh, it's to say that sure, maybe some things have gotten better and maybe racial attitudes as a whole are transitioning uh, in different directions. Uh, but I don't like meliorist progressivist accounts of racial attitudes and I don't like a, a, a entertaining the thought that things are getting better partly because I feel that to do that if only for a moment uh, is to lay ourselves open to the trap uh, of uh, patting ourselves on the back and thinking that we have made some progress. Which is fine if we like to pat ourselves on the back, but it's not so fine if one thinks that social justice requires continuous self-critique. Uh, so, yeah. Great. So, so, the sum, the total, the sum of all the parts. All the parts. And particulars and holes, mm -hmm. talk philosophy. Well, sum so, of all the parts. And, and, yeah. and remember that. No. And, and, just a little advice for you, sir, because I've been to many books down here. Uh, Mr. Your, your professor, did I tell you, he would jump on you because you didn't say one thing to this audience. BTB, if you want to know something, buy the book. <laughs> I'm oh, not yeah, trying. So that's I, my... I mean, hustles, <laughs> hustles are hustles, but, you know. <laughs> So that's my final announcement. So can, we're going to continue to grapple with all of these questions, right? And the books are for sale over there, 20% off by NYU Bookstore over there. And Danielle will be here to sign and answer more questions. So we can kind of mix and mingle as we conclude here. And feel free to enjoy the empanadas and wine. But just join me in giving a round of applause. For <laughs> Thank you. Hello. <laughs> uh, hello.